Hey everybody, this is Anthony from VR Game Rankings. Welcome to episode 13 of our daily vlog series for Wednesday, October 18th. And so today I do have a handful of minor news stories to get into. And then I have a couple of games to discuss and we'll just see how it all shakes out. Okay, so the very first news story that I have is something that I saw this morning in preparation of this episode. And TP Cast apparently has announced that they have a, an Oculus Rift version of their wireless adapter coming in the fourth quarter of 2017. Now, as we know, they do have an HTC Vive version that some people have already got. Microsoft Store had like a pre-order set up for this, but it got canceled. We're not sure what's going on with that. So the whole TP Cast thing has been a little bit sketchy in terms of like officially being available, officially being able to buy it. So it, some HTC Vive owners are starting to get their hands on that, but now they are announcing an Oculus Rift version. Now, what we don't know is if this version that's gonna be released later this year, supposedly, if it will be compatible with both the Rift and the Vive, or is it going to be specifically for the Rift? Are you going to have to buy a special TP cast for your Rift and a special TP cast for the Vive? Now, we didn't really get any other information, and it just said fourth quarter 2017. Well, we're in fourth quarter 2017 right now. So when, it, when exactly is this going to come? It's funny because if you asked me like a year ago about all this wireless stuff, I really thought that we would already be knee deep into wireless gaming. I thought I'd already have a wireless adapter myself and I'd be playing Racket NX um, over here in this area, spinning all around and not worrying about my cable. I thought we'd already be there by now, but, but it hasn't really happened. And I can tell you for myself personally, I am incredibly interested in getting a wireless adapter. I have a big, large space that I can work with. And so a wireless adapter would be huge for me. I could play something like Unseen Diplomacy without a wireless adapter. I can't even imagine how awesome an experience like Unseen Diplomacy would be with having no wireless adapter whatsoever. I mean, I mean, having no wire dragging you down during the experience, that would be incredible. But for me personally, as somebody that owns an Oculus Rift, I own an HTC Vive, I own a PlayStation VR, I'd really love a wireless adapter that could work with at least two of those. Now, I don't expect the PlayStation VR to have a wireless adapter, and it doesn't really need one because you can't get that far away from your PlayStation VR anyway. So you're probably better off just using the regular cord and all of that. But for people out there that own an Oculus Rift and an HTC Vive, yeah, I want an adapter that could possibly work with both of these headsets. And it's a little disappointing to me that it appears like you have to get a specific version for either headset. Now I know Intel has a wireless adapter that they're bringing out in the first quarter of 2018. And from what I understand, a lot of people are more excited about that particular wireless adapter because I believe it's a little bit more future-proof. Remember, we've got these new headsets that are coming. We're gonna start moving into higher resolutions and the TP cast is limited in the resolution standpoint. And also there's concerns about the microphone, whether or not it can pass the microphone audio as well. Now, supposedly that was just a firmware thing, but as far as I know, I don't know that that's ever been completely fixed, but it is still good news to hear that there is a wireless um, adapter coming for the Oculus Rift. This is something that has been needed and it's good to hear that we will have something like that and we'll have to see how that plays out. We'll have to see when are these things just going to be widely available where you don't have to jump through special hoops to get them? Like when can you just go on Amazon or something, buy one of these and it comes a week later? You know, I don't know when that's going to happen. So it, it's almost like the wireless adapter revolution for VR hasn't actually started yet. So there's that. Another little tidbit I wanted to get into is there's only two days left to get Echo Arena for free. So if you do not have an Oculus account and you don't have Echo Arena in your Oculus account, you might wanna actually go ahead and make yourself an Oculus account and go ahead and download 
Echo Arena or, or basically uh, start the purchasing process of Echo Arena so you get it registered to your Oculus account so that it will be free. Even if you don't have an Oculus Rift, you don't plan on getting an Oculus Rift, you might want to have this game locked up as a free item for use with Revive or other possible things in the future, or maybe you end up with an Oculus Rift headset in the future. Who knows? Anything can happen. It might be a good idea to go ahead and lock this up and get it registered as a free game because I believe starting on October 20th, I believe the game will be $19.99. So if you don't already have it in your Oculus account, you'll have to pay 20 bucks to get this game. Now, one thing I do understand though, is I know a lot of people, they don't want the Oculus software on their computer. And I'm not sure that you can sign up for an Oculus account without downloading all the Oculus software as well. So that is a bit of a bugaboo because I mean, I don't want to have all these different things running on all my different computers. It, it kind of sucks to have all these different clients. Sometimes they have conflicts with each other and it just gets to be a complicated, convoluted mess. So I understand that. If you don't want to download all that Oculus software just to get this free game, which you may never use in the first place, I can understand that, but I just wanted to let people know there's only two days left and it will go to a paid uh, a paid product at $19.99 for Echo Arena. Okay, um, our third story of the day is the Microsoft Mixed Reality headsets. They launched yesterday. And unfortunately, so one of the things that I wanted to do, now I, I told you guys I wanted to go out to the Microsoft store and actually get a demo. Haven't done that. I'm not worried about that right now, but what I want to talk about is the online Microsoft store, okay? Their actual store where you go look at the games that they have available and you see if you want to purchase a game and then go ahead and download that and participate in this Microsoft Mixed Reality ecosystem. So one of the things I was most interested in was checking out this Microsoft store. I'm not talking about the retail store, I'm talking about their digital store that is just built into Windows 10 and checking the uh, mixed reality games and seeing what is out there, you know, what's on this Microsoft store. Maybe there would be some surprise announcement on October 17th, yesterday. Maybe Forza 7 VR, right? Or Super Lucky's Tail VR. Still no information whatsoever on Forza 7 VR, no information on Super Lucky's Tail VR. And honestly, I looked at the games on the Microsoft Store. I'm gonna pop up a list of these games here. And it's disappointing. It's even more disappointing than I could possibly imagine. So I'll just give you a rundown of some of the games. Okay, some of them we know about. Arizona Sunshine, Super Hot, Fantastic Contraption, Form, the Halo Recruit, Dread Halls, Sky World, which launched today, I mean launched yesterday, Luna, which launched yesterday, Space Pirate Trainer, Racket NX, Dark Legion, Invoker, okay, and then Ghostbusters VR now hiring. Now, these are VR games that we've heard of before. We know about these games. A lot of them are available to Vive owners and available to Oculus Rift owners. So a lot of these are not exclusives in any way, shape, or form. Then there's a couple of VR games that I wasn't too personally aware of. There's Gun Spinning VR. There's Tea Time Golf. Heroes of the Seven Seas. Stunt Kite Masters. Headbutt Factory. Head Square and Hypercade, okay? And so, so that's the list that we're working here, working with here for the Windows Mixed Reality Store. And what I did on VR Game Rankings, you can actually go to VR Game Rankings, and if you go to the Overall Rankings tab, and, and you highlight that, and then a drop-down menu will appear, I actually made a top 20 Windows Mixed Reality VR games ranking list just based on what they had. And it was hard, man. I had to put together a top 20, and there really isn't 20 games to boast about. I mean, the top five games that I, I gave for the, for the uh, Windows Mixed Reality ranking, I put Arizona Sunshine number one, Super Hot number two, Space Pirate Trainer number three, Racket NX number four, Form number five, Dread Halls number six, Sky World seven, Fantastic Contraption eight, Hypercade, which is by Hidden Path Entertainment, I put that at number nine, 
Tea Time Golf by Barker's Crest Studio, I put that at number 10. Now, Tea Time Golf does appear to be an exclusive because I can't find this on any other VR platform as far as I can tell. Um, obviously, Halo Recruit is, is kind of an exclusive as, as far as we can tell. But I really didn't notice a bunch of other exclusives. I'm not sure about Hypercade by Hidden Path Entertainment. I'm not sure if that's available anywhere else. Now, the Ghostbusters VR now hiring, that is something that you can get on PlayStation VR, but I don't believe you can get that on Oculus or on Steam. So that's a, a PC VR exclusive, I guess you could say. But man, is this a lackluster grouping of games. It really is quite lackluster. Now, I went ahead and just made a top 20 just so I have it there. And then, obviously, people can submit their own top 20 for Microsoft Mixed Reality Games, and we'll eventually update that. And obviously, as new Microsoft Mixed Reality Games start becoming available, I will update that list, and hopefully the list will get a hell of a lot better. But right now, it is we're scraping the bottom of the barrel for a lot of the games on this list. And I'm kind of surprised by that. I thought there would be a lot more, like, where's the gallery? Where, where's all these like major VR games that have been around for so long, Rec Room. I mean, I don't think they have Rec Room for Microsoft Mixed Reality yet. So there's a lot of games that haven't shown up yet. Now, possibly they'll show up within the next few weeks here, or, you know, we're just going to have to see. But, but the thing that I'll say overall is I was really hoping that the Microsoft Mixed Reality platform, I was hoping it was going to be like this fourth pillar for VR gaming. We have, of course, the HTC Vive. We have the Oculus Rift. We have PlayStation VR. Those are the three major platforms. And if you go to, um, if you go to VR rankings, VR game rankings, and you look at the top 20 most wanted VR games for all platforms, or the top 50 most wanted games for all, for all platforms, what you'll see is some of the games it'll say, like, for example, um, and try to think of a game that's coming to all okay so like seeking dawn right seeking dawn is supposedly coming to all three systems the vive the oculus and playstation vr and so rather than than writing vive rift psvr i just put all three platforms because it's coming to all three platforms and those are the three major platforms now the with the arrival of the microsoft mixed reality headsets i was thinking man is, is it four platforms now? Is this four platforms? Apparently not, at least not yet. It does not look like this is four platforms. Now, if we did hear about Forza 7 VR, if we did hear about Lucky's, Super Lucky's Tail VR, and if these were exclusives to the Microsoft Windows Store for their mixed reality, then you could kind of consider this as a legitimate fourth platform. But right now, it really isn't a legitimate fourth platform. It's just additional headsets, and there are some games available, and eventually you'll be able to use Steam with it. But I don't really consider this as a fourth platform right now. So I was kind of worried a bit because it's like, am I going to put another, you know, another bracket on, on the top of the website for Microsoft Mixed Reality? Am I going to make this a completely separate platform and have rankings, you know, all the time for all the Microsoft Mixed Reality stuff? And it's, it's a worry that I don't have to worry about right now anyways, because it's not its own platform. It doesn't have enough stuff happening to be its own platform. So that's a little disappointing. I can't, uh, you know, hide my, my disappointment for that. I, I thought it would be much bigger. I thought this whole launch would be a much bigger deal. It's more of a soft launch. It's one of the softest launches I've ever seen. Now we are in October, okay? We are in mid-October and there's plenty of time for excitement um, as we push into November and December when maybe more of these headsets can be sold. So there's still hope. There's still hope for a Forza 7 VR version. There's still hope for Super Lucky's Tail VR. So we'll just have to wait and see. But right now, I'd say the Microsoft Mixed Reality platform, unless you're into the Windows part of the thing and using Windows and Cliff House and all of that, other than that, it seems to be kind of a dud. But that's what we're doing. That's what we're dealing with here. Okay, so along the lines of this Microsoft Mixed Reality, another little news story that popped up 
is apparently the Samsung Odyssey, which appears to be clearly the best Microsoft Mixed Reality headset out of all of them that are going to be available this year. It's not coming to Europe. Um, there's no word on why it's not coming to Europe. Companies have reached out to Samsung to try to find out what is their reasoning, why is this not coming out to Europe, but there has been no response as of this time. So we don't know why it's not coming to Europe. It's simply not coming to Europe. And this is unfortunate for a lot of the Europeans out there with wider IPDs like myself. Like I, we had this story yesterday that these Microsoft Mixed Reality headsets have a really narrow IPD. If you have a wider IPD, mine is 72, you're going to be out of luck with a lot of these Microsoft Mixed Reality headsets. You might not get that real 3D view out of it, but apparently the Samsung Odyssey is the one that actually has a physical IPD adjustment so you can dial in your IPD properly, but it's not coming to Europe. So that really sucks for the Europeans that wanted to try a mixed reality headset that maybe have a larger IPD. If anybody is in this situation personally, we would love to hear from you and hear what it's like if you happen to get your hands on one of the regular Microsoft Mixed Reality headsets and you do have a larger IPD, what is the reality for you? How is that working out for you? I know Steve from VR Roundtable, he actually got his hands on one of these Microsoft Mixed Reality headsets. He wants to run it through, his, through its paces. And if it blows him away, he's going to go ahead and hold on to it. If it doesn't blow him away, I think he's going to return it. But he wanted to check it out. He wanted to get a feel for it. But I don't know what Steve's IPD is. I'm not, I, I don't know that he has a really large IPD. So I don't know if he's going to get a feel for how 3D it is and, and how the whole IPD factor works. But I probably should send him a message about this. So it's something he can kind of check into before our next VR roundtable episode well, where he will probably talk about his early experiences with the Microsoft Mixed Reality headset. Um, okay, what other little news stories do we have here? Well, this is, uh, you know, just some small little stuff. The Gallery Episode 2, Heart of the Ember Stone, is available today. It is on Steam right now for $29.99. Now, you know what's kind of interesting about this? I've looked on the Oculus subreddit. I've looked on the Vive subreddit. And there doesn't appear to be a tremendous amount of hype surrounding the Gallery Episode 2, Heart of the Ember Stone. I'm a little bit surprised by that. And I'm wondering if part of this has to do with the Talos Principle VR hitting yesterday. That was the big game yesterday. A lot of people jumped on the Talos Principle VR. That is a $40 game. It's possible that the Gallery 2 Heart of the Ember Stone might suffer a little bit from the standpoint that it's coming a day later. A lot of people bought Talos Principle. That might be their game for this week. So they might have to wait a little while before they consider the Gallery. So it could be a case of bad timing for the Gallery Episode 1. Now I know these are two completely different kinds of games, but they're similar in certain respects. They have similar, that they kind of appeal to similar type of gamers. So there could be a little bit of a, a cannibalization going on there with the Talos Principle VR getting the lion's share of the sales by coming out a day early. Now, am I gonna play the Talos Principle VR? Yes, I am. In fact, I got the game today, I bought the game, with my own money. I'm downloading it right now. So after this episode, I am going to try it out. My theory with the Talos Principle VR is I'm going to play this game for at least an hour. And if it impresses me, I'm keeping it. If it doesn't, I'm going to go ahead and, and do a refund. Um, and I don't normally refund Steam VR games. So it's going to have to really disappoint me for me to refund it. I tried to get a code from Crow Team. They never answer my emails, so it's just one of those tough titty kind of situations. Sometimes devs aren't going to give codes, and you either have to pony up the money or you just have to let the game go. And I still want to see the Talos Principle VR, so I am going to try that. I will be able to talk about that on tomorrow's vlog. Okay, what did I try yesterday? Remember, yesterday was D-Day with all these big games coming out. Well, I went down to my local red box and I grabbed myself Gran Turismo, Gran Turismo Sport for the PlayStation 4. Now, notice I say Gran Turismo Sport for the PlayStation 4. I don't say 
Gran Turismo Sport for PlayStation VR. And that's kind of my take with this game. So I get the disc, pop it into my PS4, it has to load up, it's tons of gigs, and then when it all loads up and I'm ready to play it, oh no, I gotta download another 12 gigabyte patch. Now, I don't know if I really need this patch or not, but I go ahead and download the whole damn thing anyway, because what if I do need it? Okay, so let me tell you about the VR implementation of this game. So finally, after all the patches are downloaded, and I'm finally able to try Gran Turismo Sport VR. So I get the headset on, I click on the game. Now, normally, when you're playing PlayStation VR and you have your headset turned on, and you start a, a PlayStation 4 game that does have PSVR support, Normally what will happen is the game realizes that you have the headset turned on and the game will automatically go into the VR mode because it kind of knows, hey, you've got the VR headset turned on, this game supports VR, let's automatically go into the VR mode. That did not happen with Gran Turismo Sport and that was kind of the first bad sign that kind of started the whole thing off and it was all downhill from there. So when I first loaded up the game, it's asking me, do I have HDR? You know, uh, look at this box and change the contrast and change the bright, you know, going through all this stuff for the TV. I'm wearing my headset. I don't give a damn about this game on the TV, but it's making me go through all these different menus and stuff. So I have to go through all this crap. And all of this is flat screen, by the way. It's just on the, uh, there's no VR implementation at this point. So I'm going through the menus and I find where the VR option is and it's kind of buried and it's almost like VR tour or something. It's almost like this little extra thing like, oh yeah, there happens to be a little tiny VR support. That's basically what you're getting here from Gran Turismo Sport. And I don't know why I didn't realize this originally because I remember back at E3, this news came out that the Gran Turismo Sport VR support was going to be not a hell of a lot. There wasn't going to be a hell of a lot there. It was going to be a tepid kind of a support, not a major support. And I don't know, I just kind of forgot about that, I guess. And, and I, I was excited when I went into this experience and I thought, you know, this might be really cool because I remember seeing that trailer that recently came out that Sony had where they're showing off new games coming to the PlayStation VR and they were showing footage of people playing Gran Turismo Sport and VR and it looked pretty damn good. So I had a little bit of excitement going into this. So anyway, I finally get all the VR stuff loaded up. I'm in this little VR thing. And so it has like VR tour and VR showroom, I think is, uh, or VR play and VR showroom. There's basically these two options that you, could, that you can go into. So I go into the VR race option. You click on that. And then what it shows you is it shows you all the different tracks. And there are a lot of tracks. Apparently, virtually every track in the game is available in VR. And that is great news. But here's the bad news. The bad news is there's only a couple of tracks that are unlocked from the very beginning. In fact, there's only three different tracks that are unlocked. Now, there's five tracks but two of them are different versions of the same track. So there's really only three different tracks with two slightly different versions of two of them, giving you a total of five tracks that you can try out until you start unlocking additional tracks. Now that's not that big, big of a deal. You know, I'll go ahead and unlock tracks, but guess what I found out? You cannot unlock tracks in the VR mode. You have to go into the flat gaming mode. You have to take your headset off and you have to spend a bunch of time playing this game in flat mode to unlock tracks. It's the same thing with the cars. So there's only so many cars that are available right away. And if you want to try some other car, you have to earn credits to unlock the car. But as far as I could tell, I couldn't earn any credits whatsoever in the VR mode of the game. So again, you have to go out to the flat mode and play the game a whole bunch to unlock credits to be able to buy cars so that you could then eventually see these cars in the VR mode. Now this really sucked and it sucked for me personally because I can tell you, this is kind of off on another little tangent here, but I am really into the Ferrari 
458. Okay, Ferrari 458 Spider. It's a particular type of car that Ferrari makes, and I want one of these cars, okay? I actually, it's it's on my dream list. I want to own a Ferrari 458 Spider. Now, I know that's ridiculous because these things cost a quarter of a million dollars, and why the hell would anybody in their right right mind spend a quarter of a million dollars on a goddamn car but call me crazy i want a ferrari 458 spider and i actually plan on getting one in the next couple of years i don't know how the hell it's going to happen but i plan on getting one and i hope to get one and when i got gran turismo sport they do have a 458 not um, it's not necessarily the spider it's the italia 458 but it's basically the same car pretty much they have that in there but it costs 300,000 credits or whatever, and they only give you 50,000 credits automatically. So I would have to go, I would have to take off my headset, I would have to do a whole bunch of races and different things, trying to earn credits so I could have the 300,000 credits necessary to buy this Ferrari 458 Italia. And then what would happen is I could have that car and then when I'm going into the VR races, I could go into my garage and I could select that car and then I could actually drive that car in VR, which would be super cool because it's got the real steering wheel. The, the one nice thing about Gran Turismo Sport that I will say is the interiors, the cockpits of the car, the steering wheel, all of that looks good in the car looks really freaking good this is what polyphony digital is all about this is where their skills are they're all about details they are a slave to the details they want all the details possible and they do a damn good job with the cockpits of the car you have your uh, rear view mirror you have your side view mirror they have the cockpit there one of the coolest things actually is you have hands that are holding the steering wheel and you have gloves on your hands okay and the steering wheels, the steering wheels themselves and your hands with the gloves on them are rendered with incredible detail. That that looks really good. You'll look at it, you'll be like, damn, these hands look really good. This steering wheel looks really good. All of that is great. Now, when you look at the actual game that is taking place out your windshield and, and your side windows, it's very much like Drive Club from the standpoint that it's pixely, it's it's blocky, it has that Vaseline look. Now I will say that if you make a, a straight comparison of this game head to head with Drive Club, I would say that it's not quite as chunky, it's not quite as pixelated, it doesn't have quite as much of the Vaseline look, but it's still there. All of that is still there, it's just not quite as bad as Drive Club, but there are some major caveats to this as well. Guess what? There's no time trial. There's no time trial as far as I could tell in VR mode. The only thing that you can do in VR mode is you can race these various tracks against one other car. That's it. Okay, and this other car that you're racing against, you only see this other car for maybe 10 seconds and then you'll never see it again because the AI for this other driver is absolutely awful. You'll pass them within the first 30 seconds of the race, probably even less than that, and you'll never see that other car again. On the bright side, I will say that when that other car is near you, as long as that other car is, say, 30 yards or less away from your car, it looks pretty damn good. You know, it's, swer it's swerving in and out, it's doing its thing, and it looks pretty damn good. But once that car gets a little farther off into the distance, like 40, 50 yards off into the distance, it starts to turn into a pixelated mess, okay? It's blurry, it's pixelated, and it really starts to break down. And that's kind of the problem with all racing games in VR. One of the biggest limitations that VR headsets have right now is distant objects. Distant objects, it's hard to have them detailed. They usually end up a bunch of pixels. They end up fuzzy, aliasing, uh, dithering, whatever. I don't know the technical word for it, but it starts to really break down as things get farther and farther away. I talked about this in Arctica 1. The graphics of Arctica 1 are incredible, but every once in a while you're looking at a drone that is really far away and it looks like a blurry pixelated mess. And that's just a problem that we have with these current generation one of these current headsets. So 
Is there any other redeeming qualities about Gran Turismo Sport to talk about before we just dismiss this thing? Because it's pretty much a joke if you really think about it. The only thing else I'll say is the lighting engine is damn good if you're racing in a sunny a sunny track you know if it's not overcast because a bunch of the tracks that they give you right away they're set during an overcast day and there's not a lot of visual impact that's going on but when it is sunny polyphony digital does a really nice job of the sun kind of coming through your windshield the sun kind of bathing your steering wheel or going into darkness and then it gets dark they do a good job with that also, I will say that the tracks overall, okay, so the roadside detail, like things that are on the side of the track, like little houses and people and little things that are along the sides of the track, that stuff looks really bad. That stuff looks like PlayStation 2 quality. It looks like you're playing a PlayStation 2 game if you start looking at the roadside detail. But if you take the tracks in totality of just the track itself, some of these tracks look pretty damn good especially when they have you in like an actual speedway, almost like an Indy 500 track where it's just an oval and you're making the left turns constantly. Those actually look pretty damn good. And it's pretty impressive when you're in there and you're driving it and you have that steering wheel, you have that cockpit and you're racing around. That actually looks pretty good. So, I mean, there were some, some minor parts during my experience where I was actually a little impressed with what was going on here. But when I came to the realization that I'm limited to these tracks and I'm limited to these cars unless I take my headset off and spend a bunch of hours playing this game to try to unlock additional tracks and try to unlock additional cars, I don't care about flat gaming any anymore. I don't want to play flat gaming anymore. So I don't want to spend any time with my headset off. If I'm going to play a video game, it's going to be VR. I don't have any time for flat gaming anymore. And so for them to lock VR content behind non-VR game time makes literally no sense whatsoever. But what we're realizing with this Gran Turismo Sport is that VR, the VR support, is a complete afterthought. I believe this game is $59.99 if you wanted to go buy it at Best Buy or wherever. 60 bucks to get Gran Turismo Sport. If all you're interested in is the VR mode, do not do it whatsoever. It is not worth 60 bucks. I don't even know if it's worth $19.99. Like if Polyphony Digital and Sony, if they made the VR version of this game like its own separate entity for 20 bucks on PSN that you could download, I don't even know if it's worth that. I mean, that's how bad it is. Unless they were to unlock all the tracks and all the cars, I just can't see it, you know. So Gran Turismo Sport, major disappointment. It's almost, it's almost disappointing that they even bothered with it in the first place because this is almost a blemish on PlayStation VR. This is fuel for the haters. The haters will say, yeah, Gran Turismo Sport doesn't even care about VR. Look what they did with VR. And it's true, they really don't, you know? And so it's kind of disappointing from that standpoint because I really thought this could be a prime time PlayStation VR showpiece type of game. But if you want racing action on your PlayStation VR, go with Drive Club VR, go with Dirt Rally, do not go with this. That's Gran Turismo Sport. Okay, I'm actually past the 30 minute mark. And once again, I didn't get to raw data on PSVR. Um, hopefully I'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to talk about the Talos Principle and also the Gallery, Episode 1, I mean Episode 2, Heart of the Ember Zone. I should be able to talk about all that stuff on tomorrow's episode, so definitely stay tuned for that, and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Take it easy.